Good evening. Welcome to Northwest Tonight with Annabelle Tiffin. Our top story. The funeral is held for Sir Tony Lloyd as senior Labour figures join his family to remember the veteran MP. Tony was a huge part of the Labour family, which is what I said to his family today. Thank you for giving him to us and allowing us to spend so much time with him. Sir Tony died last month, aged 73. Also tonight, warnings that a fire that burned for a month could be a problem for years unless the government steps in to help. Time for New Trafford. Could Manchester United have a brand new home within five years? New legs and a new lease of life for Cola, thanks to artificial limbs from a Stockport firm. And it becomes even more unsettled as we look ahead to the weekend with some rain on its way. I'll have all the details later on in the programme. Politicians from all sides paid tribute to Sir Tony Lloyd, whose funeral was held in Stratford today. The 73-year-old Rochdale MP died last month. His family asked mourners at his funeral to continue to hold him in your hearts. Our reporter, Mairead Smith, was there. Sir Tony Lloyd, a man who brought people together in life and today in death. A wicker coffin carried the 73-year-old's remains into the Church of St Hugh of Lincoln in Stratford. I count him not only as a political colleague, but as a friend. And uh, in politics, you don't get too many of those, but Tony certainly was one of my political friends. He was a remarkable man. That's how he's being described by people who worked alongside him, across the house from him. They also said that he was a conciliator, that he brought people together. He wanted to advance, make progress in politics, but he, he did so in a caring and a, and a compassionate way. It was such a moving uh, funeral, but a funeral full of humour as well, because Tony had a mischievous sense of humour and that really came across today. The former Prime Minister Gordon Brown told the congregation Tony Lloyd was the most popular, most committed and most compassionate member of Parliament you could ever meet. And the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, attended alongside the Mayor for Greater Manchester. Tony meant so much to all of us in so many ways. As a new MP, when I went into Parliament, you know, he was there and he would bit of word here, you know, quiet advice, always considered, thoughtful, decent, that was, that was Tony. Sir Tony Lloyd was first elected to Parliament to represent Stratford in 1983. He also served as MP for Manchester Central and later stood down from Parliament to become the first Greater Manchester Police and Crime Commissioner in 2012. He returned for a second stint in the Commons in 2017, representing Rochdale. What a lovely gentleman and an honour and a privilege to have known him and to attend today. Tony was my uh, constituency MP for a number of years and he introduced me to politics so many years ago. At the end of the order of service, Sir Tony Lloyd's family thanked everyone who attended today and they said that the tributes that have been extended are testament to the person he was. They asked people to please continue to hold him in your hearts as he will be forever in ours. Labour's deputy leader delivered the eulogy and said Sir Tony Lloyd was guided by a deep sense of duty. Tony was a huge part of the Labour family, which is what I said to his family today. Thank you for giving him to us and allowing us to spend so much time with him. He was an internationalist as well as looking after the people of Rochdale and Greater Manchester. The sun shone for Sir Tony Lloyd's final journey as he was led to rest in a private ceremony for a lifelong public servant. Marit Smith, BBC Northwest Tonight. Brianna Jai's mother says she reported hate-filled comments about her daughter to X, formerly known as Twitter, but the company refused to take them down. Esther Jai says the hate aimed at her murdered daughter on social media had been horrendous. She, told, she says X told her the comments didn't breach their policies. 95,000 people have now signed her petition for tougher laws to make social media companies behave more responsibly. The convicted Merseyside drug dealer Curtis Warren has been charged with seven further breaches of his serious crime prevention order. The 60-year-old appeared in court in December, charged with 11 breaches, but has now been accused of seven further offences relating to his vehicles, finances and communication devices. He remains on bail and is due in court again in June. 
Allegations that a snail farm was secretly set up inside a disused department store are being investigated by Preston City Council. It's claimed an unlicensed snail farm has been in operation in the former British Home Stores building. A worker close to the site told the BBC they saw trays full of snails brought out of the premises every few months. Visitors to Chester Zoo have caught the first glimpse of a rare baby monkey. The Colombian black-headed spider monkey has been named Olive and was first spotted being cradled in the arms of her mother, Chiara. More than 80% of the species has been lost in the last 50 years. Now, an investigation found that the treatment of a pregnant black woman at Liverpool Women's Hospital was delayed because of cultural and ethnic bias. The hospital says it's introduced a focused anti-racism strategy. Well, our reporter Andy Gill is at the Liverpool Women's Hospital for us this evening. So, Andy, just explain what happened in this case. Well, Annabelle, this happened in March last year. It involved a 31-year-old black African woman who was 18 weeks pregnant. When she came here to the Liverpool Women's Hospital, she was in severe pain. Her baby died. The woman was taken to another hospital, but her condition continued to deteriorate, and she, the mum, died herself a couple of days later. And, Andy, what did the investi investigation uh, into the death conclude? Well, an inquiry was carried out into this by a part of the NHS called the Maternity and Newborn Safety Investigations. It found a number of factors. There were staff shortages, there'd been a junior doctor strike, but they also found that staff here had not taken some observations on the woman because she was being difficult. The inquiry concluded that there was the impact of systemic cultural bias and stereotyping on provision of staff and effective care. And they got the impression that cultural bias and stereotyping may sometimes go unchallenged here and be perceived as being acceptable at the trust. Unconscious bias had caused delays in the treatment that this woman had received. And how has the hospital responded? Well, the hospital has said that it's introduced a focused anti-racism strategy and new ways of handling patients who are deteriorating. They sent us a statement from the hospital's chief nurse which said that they extend their sincerest condolences to the family involved in this tragic case and it said we are absolutely committed to learn, improve and embed change to ensure that no woman experiences any detriment in her care due to her ethnicity. A separate report covering the whole of the UK found that between 2019 and 2021 uh, women from black uh, and ethnic backgrounds were four times more likely to die during or immediately after pregnancy than white women. The hospital here is in the Liverpool Riverside constituency and the MP here, Kim Johnson, who is herself black, has called for urgent action to make sure that this doesn't happen again and she says she's going to talk to the management here at the hospital about what they're doing to respond to this case. Andy, thanks very much. Now, a fire in Lancaster, which took over a month to put out, could continue causing problems for years to come. The local council says a lack of support from the government is stopping progress. Mike Stevens reports. For Denise Cooper, the past two months have been hard. At one point, the smoke got that bad, she had to spend three nights in a hotel. You come home from work of an evening and the, and the smell, I've actually been close to, uh, to retching. Um, with, you know, it makes you feel so nauseated, it's really unpleasant. Denise lives just a stone's throw from the old Williamson power station near Lancaster city centre. The site was built in the 40s and was recently used to store waste from skips. This building was stacked full of waste. On the 3rd of December last year, a huge fire broke out, which was still burning in late January. The majority of incidents that you attend, the fire is out within hours, if not minutes. But this has been going on for two months now. This was a really challenging incident in terms of just the significant amount of waste in, stored within this building. So I think it's approximately 13,000 tonnes of waste within the building. Two thirds of it have been removed, but there is still pockets of heat within the waste and uh, clearly the, the ideal 
situation would be for all of this to be removed. This is 3,000 tonnes of old rubbish. At one point, this heap was four times the size of what it is now. And if you look around, you can see bits of kids' clothes, there's the odd tyre, there's bits of shoes. It's the contents of years' worth of skips that have been compacted right down. And underneath all this is where the fire has kept burning. The local council don't have a responsibility for the site, but they've spent almost a million pounds clearing the burnt waste. They're asking the government for urgent help. It really does need to, to come very urgently. We've been raising that with government for some considerable time. Um, the £900,000 that we've put in, um, there's a big chunk of that that is landfill tax, for example. So not only have central government failed to provide you with any emergency funding, they're actually making money out of this incident in landfill tax. That's correct. Half of it will be going or has gone already in terms of landfill tax. So we made a request to waive that landfill tax and HMRC has said that there is no mechanism for waiving the tax. That's really disappointing. The government says it's still considering the council's request. Meanwhile, other organisations are now involved. The Environment Agency has two live criminal investigations which are currently underway. Um, we've got a team of officers on the ground who are investigating and, and trying to get to the root cause of what's happened here. It's quite alarming. Back at Denise's house, she's in no doubt as to what needs to happen. Obviously there are financial constraints, but I really think that the central government really does need to help with something of, of this size. Mike Stevens, BBC Northwest Tonight in Lancaster. Now, he has spent 64 days at sea, rode 3,000 miles across the Atlantic and raised more than a quarter of a million pounds for Alzheimer's Research UK. Frank Rothwell, the owner of Oldham Athletic, at the age of 73, completed his world re record challenge last night. Exhausted but elated, he spoke to me briefly last night, but we caught up again today to find out how the last few hours have been. Been very very busy. We've got so much media attention from around the world, and it's uh, it's fantastic. We're able to promote the uh, the charity. Brilliant. We mentioned last night that we were hoping you'd get a good night's sleep in a comfortable bed. How was it? Did you get a good night's sleep? I was worried about you. Oh god, no, I didn't. Uh, yesterday I had so much sugar during the day. And then when I arrived here, I wanted to drink nothing but Coca Cola, cold Coca Cola. And I was I was Coca Cola up and <laughs> I so sugar. When I laid in bed last night, oh, I couldn't get to it. Couldn't rest at all. Despite not having a good night's sleep, how good is it to have him back? Oh, it's lovely. It's really really nice <clears throat> to see him looking um, a bit doddery at first, but he's uh, getting straightened up a bit now. Um, it's just nice being, you know, back as a family, mm. uh, full on without worrying after the uh, three episodes of uh, capsizing and go trying to get in at the wrong island and falling asleep yesterday. So it's just nice that it's over and the fundraising is going up. What was the hardest part of it all, do you think? Well, the, 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 uh, the emotional side of it is by far the hardest thing. Keeping you, uh, keeping yourself concentrated and putting effort into what you're doing, uh, or you end up just just going through the motions and not putting any power into the rowing. Actually, keeping your head fixed on the jo job in hand, and uh, yeah, it is that's the the hardest thing. It, a, a very emotional blow, you know, and missing my family, I found that particularly difficult. This is the second time you've done it, Frank. Is there going to be a third time? No, definitely not. This is, <laughs> it's, 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 this time was too difficult. And the highlights, what would you say the highlight was? Well, obviously the highlight was, uh, was getting home. Um, getting seeing the, the family when we came around the headland, that's obviously going to be the highlight. The highlights are every day, twice a day. I used to fall on Judy's up twice a day. In the morning, she was waking up, and at night, she was going to bed. I always try to do it at the same time. It was so lovely to see you get off your boat, and, and the first thing you wanted to do was, was hug Judith. How special was that? Oh, especially that's the that's the moment you're thinking about all the time. Even before you set off, 
you think, oh yeah, I'm going to look forward to the final bit, you know. Yeah, it's sort of something you, you think about all the time. It's, it's the ultimate tick the box, don't it? Yeah. But, uh, have, I, have I done this to just have a hug and a cuddle when we're finished? Oh, it's special. <laughs> Well done, Frank, and well done, Judith, because it, it's really tough. He was away for a long, long time, but they're very pleased to see each other, aren't they? Now, Astrid Allegra is only 14, but she's been singing jazz for her family for years. Now the teenager from Southport is the youngest artist to be signed up by the record company, which represents the likes of Kylie Minogue and George Ezra. Alice Scarf has been to meet her. Slow down, you crazy child. Meet Astrid, a teenager from Southport, who is the youngest person to sign for record label BMG. At just 14 years old, she has signed a five-track deal. I went to Leicester. Um, I was recording with one of their producers. Uh, we did five songs. And it was really cool, because I've never wrote with anyone else before. I was so used to writing by myself. And I was, uh, I was nervous at first. I didn't know how it was going to go. But it went good. It went really good. BMG worked with the likes of Kylie Minogue, Mabel, Blink-182 and many more. I'm a widow. What the hell am I doing here? The label spotted her cover online of Radiohead's Creep, which has now reached over 3.6 million views. I went on The Voice and after that I decided to start doing social media. I did just singing videos and people liked it. It was unusual because kids my age didn't really know of jazz. My nan, um, she used to sing with me. She used to put on her records and we used to sing along together. Um, and then I went on holiday and I sang on karaoke and my mum thought, oh, you have a talent for it. <laughs> and so I kind of pursued it because I enjoyed it and I loved it. Using a home setup, Astrid and her dad, Greg, would record and edit her songs. So when they saw BMG's recording studio, they were blown away. It's an amazing, really, you know. Um, we had no idea of how complicated it all is, you know, and how um, much there is to it. I've always been trying to know what matter what she does but this is extra special the teenager known as astrid allegra hopes her new tracks are just the start of the journey to the top of the charts alice scarf bbc northwest tonight Oh, good luck to her. She's certainly in good company, isn't she, on the record label? Right, we're going to move on to sport now. Ian is here. Manchester United have been making really good progress on the pitch and now might be continuing off it. They might be. Yeah. They? they might be. Tell uh, us all. It's widely reported today that Ineos billionaire Sir Jim Ratcliffe, who's acquiring a 25% stake uh, in the club, will oversee a rebuild of Old Trafford that could cost him billions, which is rather a lot of money. But then again, he's a man with rather a lot of ambition. It would mean the end to any talk of moving to a new ground and give Old Trafford, which is already Britain's biggest club stadium, a capacity of 90,000. I've been finding out what fans think today. It'll always be the theatre of dreams, but to some people, Old Trafford is starting to look like very, very Old Trafford. Yes, wear and tear is one of life's inevitabilities, but Sir Jim Ratcliffe wants the wow factor and is reportedly ready to spend more than £2 billion. From what I've read, he hasn't got the net worth anyway. He's got assets, but he's not going to be able to afford to do that. They should not knock it down, that's for sure. There's a lot of work needs to be on a place, and if the money's there, you could do with spending it. Most football grounds of a certain age are bound to show their age, but United's lofty status in the game is far removed from this lofty leak in the roof a few years ago. There's never been a major redevelopment since controversial owners the Glazers took over nearly 20 years ago, with the quadrants of the last work carried out in 2006. It's just an easy thing to pick on, isn't it, for opposition fans and uh, people to uh, slate the Glazers. We want the Glazers out, but uh, it was the best stadium in the world, wasn't it, 20 years ago? It's just time for uh, a lick of paint and uh, a bit of redevelopment. Development. And what about the uh, potential to have a 90,000 capacity to so increase it by about 15,000? Um, I think that would be good. I think it would attract a lot more tourists than actual fans. Other Premier League clubs have decided to leave their long-standing homes. Everton's new stadium at Bramley Moor Dock should be up and running next year. The high-tech, multi-purpose Tottenham Hotspur Stadium opened in 2019.
Let's face it, despite its flaws, this is still a stadium of huge character and history. I remember coming here back in 1996, shortly after what's now the Sir Alex Ferguson stand was opened. My mate, who was a season ticket holder, said, you've got to see this new stand, it's huge. Sure enough, it was, and it still looks impressive now, but even that was nearly three decades ago. Liverpool's Anfield has been redeveloped and expanded in recent years after plans for a new stadium were abandoned. Much of the new Anfield Road end opened up earlier this month. I mean, I know theirs was in terms of obviously getting more fans through, which generates more revenue. Obviously, if you can, if you can do that and it makes, I suppose, the match day experience better here, then that's got to be better, isn't it, in the long term? While ahead of United's Premier League match at Luton on Sunday, the manager has praised Sir Jim Ratcliffe and Ineos. You see, you feel uh, that ambition. Uh, the players, the staff are very aligned with the ambitions of Ineos because that's why we are here. That's why we are uh, playing for Man United. Uh, we want to win and we want to, to achieve the highest. The Wembley of the North, they call it. Uh, tomorrow, struggling Burnley host Arsenal in the Premier League. At lunchtime, leaders Liverpool, whose boss Jurgen Klopp was today named Manager of the Month, could extend their lead over Manchester City to five points for a couple of hours at least if they beat Brentford. City play improving Chelsea. It's an exceptional team. Exceptional in all departments. One of the toughest games we have until the end of the season. No nonsense answer there from uh, Pep Guardiola. Now, if you're watching last night, you'll have seen our preview to the new Super League season. Tonight, the first North West teams are in action. St Helens host London Broncos, Salford Red Devils are at Leeds Rhinos, while after making history last season by winning the Challenge Cup for the first time in 52 years, what a moment that was, Lee Leopards begin their 2024 Super League campaign at home to Huddersfield Giants. We've got to keep improving and keep developing as a group. And nine new faces come in for the 24 season. Um, that just shows our intent with you know the five-year plan of of wanting to get the retention and recruitment um, as good as we can get it to, to make sure that we're striving to get better players in and, and to win more. And there's a big game in the Women's Super League kicking off shortly. Second place Manchester City are at leaders Chelsea, Annabelle. Thank you very much, Ian. Well, thank you. Thank you. Now, Kola the dog had the toughest of starts to life in Thailand. After suffering terrible abuse, he lost the lower part of both front legs. Luckily, though, he was rescued by a couple who ran a dog charity. And since then, Kola has moved back to England and today visited a specialist centre in Stockport to receive new legs and a new lease of life. Juliet Phillips was there. Come on, good boy. This was a big moment for Kola trying on his brand new prosthetic legs for the first time. Hey, good boy. He was rescued by his now owner, John, after losing both his front limbs, suffering horrific abuse by a man in Thailand. Prosthetics have since changed Kola's life, and now it's time for a new pair. Without these legs, he could not behave like a normal dog. At home, he gets around without them. That's fine, he can get around the garden and uh, kangaroo style but he couldn't go out for a proper walk. So it is vitally important for him to be able to live a normal life. Kola's had prosthetic legs before, including blades similar to those worn by Paralympians, but they became uncomfortable. And after suffering wear and tear, his current pair are on their last legs. So it's hoped the more durable new ones will be able to keep up with this very active pooch. He loves going out for a walk. It's the highlight of the day, and that's... Uh, you know, excitement when it's walk time is you have to see it, but it's really loves it. Even after the horrendous time Cola's had, he's still such a lovely, affectionate dog, isn't he? He loves people, he loves attention, and even on the beach, everybody, the regulars all know him, and he, he knows the people who give him a treat. He loves the other dogs as well, you know, he's always friendly with every dog he meets. Yeah, he's actually a perfect dog, to be honest. Here in the workshop in Stockport, they make hundreds of human limb prosthetics every year. But these, custom made for Cola, are the first ones they've ever created for an animal. Toby was the creator of Cola's brand new legs. From a prosthetic point of view, the front legs of a dog are a bit like the arms of a human. So, so when you're making the sockets, you can compare it to making a socket for a, somebody who has lost an, an arm below the elbow. It's interesting to do. It's, um, it's a piece of a challenge and he's a lovely dog, so, so why wouldn't you? Come on, Cola, let's 
be off. After the toughest of starts, Kola has come on in leaps and bounds, and it's hoped his brand new legs right, will last him for many years to come. Juliet Phillips, BBC Northwest tonight, Stockport. Good boy. I needed a warning before that. That was adorable. Oh, Cola. How do I follow that? I don't, well, I don't think you can. <laughs> Let's just see Cola again. No, we better not. We better have the weather. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do have some rain in the forecast. And a warning too, Annabelle, yes. But for the time being, well, today we had some sunshine. We had some showers around. This lovely picture was captured by one of our weather watchers with the rainbow there in the background. But the day started off with quite a bit of mist and murk. There were even reports Blackpool Tower had disappeared in some of that mist and fog earlier this morning. You can see a rather murky picture here too in Lancaster and actually that's the story for this evening and overnight we'll see a return of some of that mist and fog um, it is largely dry but there will be some scattered showers and especially later in the night by the early hours some showers to the Isle of Man into Cumbria some mist and fog for the coast of Cumbria especially for the hills as well and temperatures overnight dipping to around seven or eight Celsius so staying mild and tomorrow morning still a few scattered showers but largely dry there'll be some brighter spells but it is all set to change as by the afternoon you can see that rain arriving in from the west and some of this will be heavy at times but staying mild so temperatures tomorrow afternoon will climb up to 12 to 15 celsius so this rain will be heavy in places now you can see this weather front arriving in a warm front at first and the cold front bringing outbreaks of heavy persistent rain now there is some uncertainty of how quickly it will clear it does look for us by Sunday afternoon, it should be a bit drier, but there is some uncertainty, so do keep up to date with the forecast. And the Met Office have already issued a yellow weather warning. Now, this warning for rain covers most of England and Wales, and for us, most of the region apart from the Isle of Man. And it's valid from 3 o'clock in the afternoon tomorrow all the way through to Sunday afternoon. But as I say, it does look like that rain will clear from us during the day on Sunday. You can see some outbreaks of showery rain for a time Sunday morning, and some of it's still heavy in places, but by the afternoon, it should become drier and it should become a bit brighter. And staying mild, despite all the cloud and rain, temperatures reaching around 11 or 12 Celsius, maybe a degree or two lower than Saturday. And then looking ahead to next week, I'm afraid it does stay quite unsettled and mild too. Monday, Tuesday, still 10 to 12 Celsius. There'll be outbreaks of rain at times, some drier interludes, and by the end of the week, becoming a little cooler, more to average for the time of year. And that's your forecast for now. Cool, so thank you very much. So, yes. what have you got up at the weekend? Anything exciting? Oh, my niece's surprise birthday party. Oh, that's so, lovely. Yeah, so that'll be nice. But not a fun. surprise if she's watching this. Oh, goodness me, I've spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> Shh. Have a good weekend. Bye bye. <laughs>